from Hunter College. My name is Suborno Isaac Berry, and welcome to lecture number 12, or 13 actually, of real analysis. Today we're doing limit points and isolated points. But before that, let's go over the definition of an open set and a closed set. Now, of course, an open set, as we discussed a while ago, is just a set such that for every single point in our set, like for example over here, there exists an epsilon such that the epsilon neighborhood of that point is a subset of our set. So like for example, this point right over here, there exists this epsilon specifically where it's a complete subset. But what if we have something like this where our set is continuous over here, has one discrete point over here, then continues over there. Then it's not open because for everything else, this property holds, but over here, epsilon, no matter what epsilon we choose, then this will never be a proper subset because there is this empty space which is outside of our set. So no matter how big we make our epsilon, the, there were still these little empty spaces in between, which make it not a proper subset. Or a subset at all. So, oops. That is what open means. Now, can you guess what closed means? Not open. Bad idea. So, I know we defined closed as something whose complement is open. However, our textbook defines closed as a set which contains all its limit points. Don't worry. We'll co uh, coincide these two later. And that later time has come because now we're going to show that a set which contains all its limit points uh, has a complement which is open. But first, let's talk about isolated points. What is an isolated point? Well, it's any point in the set which is not a limit point. So let's go over some examples. What about the set which just contains zero? So what are the limit points here? Well, there are none, of course. And what about the isolated points? Well, an isolated point is any point in the set which is not a limit point. So in this case, it's zero. So what about a different set, like the rational numbers? What are the limit points? Well, you might expect it to just be Q itself. However, think about this. A limit point is essentially the limit of a sequence which can be formed using the elements of our set. So, 1 is rational, right? What about 1 point, or rather, 3 is rational? What about 3.1? What about 3.14, maybe? What about 3.141? Still rational, right? 3141 over 100, 1000? All right, how about 3.1415? Let's say 31415 over 10,000. Oh, I forgot. It's not the University of Pune. It's the University of Mumbai. Oh, okay. Th what about 3.14159? Maybe. Or 3.141592 for being a little extra. Or maybe 3.1415926. And eventually, what do you think this is approaching? This is pi? Yeah, it's approaching pi. But all of these numbers are rational, right? So, that means that pi is a limit point, but pi is not included here. So, we can actually make any real number a limit point by just making our sequence a finite number of its decimal digits. So, for example, rad2, 
we can start with one, then go to the next digit, 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 and so on and so forth. And we are still forming rational numbers. And so that means that every irrational number is also a possible limit point. But wait, adding these two together, this is just the real numbers. And what about its isolated points? Well, of course, since every single rational number is a limit point, there are no isolated points. All right, so there are some examples of limit and isolated points. Now let's get to our first theorem of today, proving that our old definition, so let's say S is closed. That means that it contains every single one of its limit points. So then, prove that the complement of S is open. Figure this one out myself, because I apparently forgot to write it down, but prove that the complement of S is open. All right, so this is going to be a proof by contradiction. So let's say we have this closed set right here. Now, this is just a specific one, easy to visualize. Of course, a general closed set could be something way more different. But we'll just have this closed interval right here. And so the complement is going to be this obviously open set right over here, which is just the union of two, each individually open set. But how do we know that they are open? So that's what we're going to be doing right now, proving that they're open. So say they're not open. That means that there exists at least one x in this complement set, such that for all epsilon, mm, s, mm, x, uh, v epsilon of x is never a subset of s complement. But wait, if it's never a subset of s complement, that means that there exists some epsilon, obviously positive, such that the epsilon of x is it must be entirely within the original set, because there's no way it can't be in either set, right? So that means that we have this. There exists an epsilon greater than zero, such that the epsilon neighborhood of x is in s. Of course, we'd have to exclude x because x itself has to be an s complement. But wait a darn second. Wait right over here. Because there exists epsilon is greater than zero. But wait a second. That would imply that x is a limit point of s. But x is not in s. Which means that s doesn't contain all its limit points. But S is closed, which means that can't happen, which means we have a contradiction right over here, which means that if S contains all its limit points, S complement is open, re-coinciding our two definitions. So, yeah, that's our first theorem. This lecture about limit points, isolated points, and variation of parameters. I was just cameraman. If you want to help us continue making videos about more obscure topics like these, Please join us on Patreon. It's down below.